My whole life, the wilderness has been a friend, a sanctuary of tranquility for me. Growing up in the expansive mountains of North Idaho, over 30 miles from the closest town of 2,000 souls, taught me how to respect and understand the woods. Every tree, every stream, every living creature, I knew them all. But this place, this damn plot north of Spokane, Washington, was different. It didn't welcome me like the rest of nature did. It was as though the land itself was in pain, and it didn't want me there. My wife's uncle Jay and a family friend Kay had purchased this tract of land at a discount. The story was that an aluminum smelter had polluted the ground years ago, tainting the water beneath and making it impossible to use. It was supposed to be a bargain, a new start, but it seemed to me more like a curse. They both set up campers to live in, each marking their territory on their respective plots. Jay, always a bit edgy, started acting stranger than usual a few months into living there. He claimed people were stalking him, eyes peering at him from the dark forest that ringed the property. It was easy to dismiss him at first, attributing his fears to the isolation. But then, he was attacked. I can still remember the day clearly. I was at the main town when I received the call. A man, a wanderer of sorts, had an interaction with Jay in the woods, which ended in a physical assault. Jay's jaw was broken in the altercation. The stranger, upon being arrested, confessed that he had been overcome with an inexplicable desire to kill Jay. Just like that, out of the blue. This man, whom Jay had never met before, had decided to see if he could kill him with a single punch. I was shocked. This wasn't the kind of nature I was accustomed to. This wilderness was different, darker. Something about this place was sick, diseased. A couple of months passed, and Jay was found murdered, in cold blood, inside his camper. He was found by Kay, who had immediately fled the scene to call the police. Jay was killed in his sleep, his brains bashed in with a power tool that lay nearby, evidence of the brutality inflicted upon him. The murderer turned out to be a 19-year-old boy, his motive as simplistic as wanting Jay's bike. His bike. Jay was killed over a bike. His death sent chills through my spine. This was no regular murder. This was something sinister. Something was wrong with this place, and I could feel it in the marrow of my bones. But little did I know then, the horror was only beginning. Following Jay's violent death, the property sat in eerie silence. It felt as though the land itself was grieving. Kay, however, had to contend with more than just the loss of a friend. The camper, which was once a symbol of fresh starts and bargain land deals, now stood as a haunting reminder of a brutal end. Loneliness and fear became his only companions. He found himself unable to live there alone, and so he called us. In the middle of a chilly night, Kay's trembling voice echoed from the phone. I need you. I can't stay here alone. Not after... What happened to Jay? I hesitated, but I could hear the desperation in his voice. The thought of returning to that cursed plot made my skin crawl, but the thought of leaving Kay to battle his demons alone was even worse. So, my pregnant wife and I packed our lives into suitcases and boxes, and ventured north to Spokane. As soon as we turned off the highway onto the gravel pathway leading to the property, a sense of dread washed over me. It was almost like the land was breathing, inhaling and exhaling waves of foreboding that clung to my skin and made my heart pound. I remember the crows distinctly, hundreds of them. They blanketed the dirt road leading up to the property, their obsidian eyes glistening ominously in the afternoon light. The sight of them felt like a warning. It felt like they were guarding the gates of some forbidden realm, their cause echoing through the air like an elegy for our peace of mind. Once we set foot on the property, it felt like we'd entered a different realm altogether. Every tree seemed to hide an unseen menace, every rustle of the leaves sounding like whispers in a language we couldn't comprehend. I was accustomed to the music of the woods, but this, this was a tune that filled me with unease. The paranoia that had consumed Jay seemed to seep into my bones. The nights were the worst. The darkness that fell was not of this world. It was a blanket of terror, muting every familiar noise and replacing it with sounds that set your nerves on edge. Sleep eluded us. Each shadow seemed to hold a secret, each silence seemed pregnant with menace. Never before had I felt so watched, so hunted. It was like an invisible predator had set its sights on us. 
Even my wife, normally the most level-headed of us all, confessed to feeling a perpetual sense of fear. Every creak, every footstep in the dark took on a sinister note. In the days that followed, I kept asking myself why we didn't leave. But it wasn't that simple. We had made a promise to Kay, a promise to stick by him. Yet, with each passing day, the sense of dread multiplied. It was not just the brutal history of the land that chilled us to the bone. There was something else, something lurking beneath the surface. A fear, so profound, so deep-rooted, that it gnawed at our sanity. Something that made us wish we'd never accepted Kay's haunting invitation. As days turned into weeks, we found a way to settle into the unsettling routine of life on the property. We went about our days with as much normalcy as we could muster, considering the circumstances. But beneath that veneer of daily routines and chores, the sense of dread persisted, an ever-present undercurrent. One day, Kay began to fall ill. He started complaining of dizziness, nausea, and persistent headaches. Concerned, I took him to the local hospital where they ran a series of tests. All the tests came back normal. Probably a flu, the doctor shrugged, but deep down I knew it wasn't as simple as that. The day we returned from the hospital marked the anniversary of Jay's murder. A heavy atmosphere blanketed the property, the echoes of the past year's events seeming to hang in the air. I had hoped that after this day, things would get better, but it was a vain hope. This place didn't forget. It didn't let go. Three days after the anniversary, Kay woke us up in the middle of the night. I could hear him screaming, a raw, primal sound filled with fear and pain. By the time my wife and I stumbled out of our camper, Kay was in his car, ramming it into a nearby tree. The sound of metal on wood, followed by the absolute silence, was bone-chilling. I ran to the wreck, and what I saw through the window still haunts me. Kay was gasping for air, clutching his chest. The fear in his eyes was something I'd never seen before, an indescribable terror that no human should ever have to endure. Despite my frantic attempts at CPR, Kay breathed his last that night. The paramedics pronounced him dead upon arrival, but I already knew. That day, Kay had joined Jay, both claimed by this accursed land within a span of one year. Their deaths shook me to my core. The inexplicable sickness, the strange sense of dread, the eerie happenings, everything pointed to something profoundly wrong with this place. Something beyond our understanding. But what I couldn't comprehend was why we didn't leave right away. We were trapped in this cycle of dread and death, unable to break free. Then came the day I discovered the chipmunks. I had gone out to fetch fresh water from the drum we had set up, and was hit with a nauseating stench. Inside the drum, barely visible through the small opening, were the mutilated remains of chipmunks. Spines, heads, bits and pieces of small bodies floating in the water. It wasn't just the gruesome sight that made my stomach churn. It was the realization that something had torn them apart and placed them there deliberately. The fear began to seep deeper into our lives. Nights became unbearable, the sense of unease growing stronger with each passing day. It felt like we were living in a nightmare, and no matter how much we wished, we couldn't wake up from it. We were trapped in an unseen torment, and we didn't know how to escape. Life on the property had turned into a waking nightmare. The bizarre occurrences of the day were only a precursor to the terror that awaited us at night. Every creak, every rustle of the wind seemed to hold an echo of the horror that this land had borne witness to. Every footfall seemed to resonate with an unseen, malevolent force. One day, after returning from a short trip into town, the world seemed to shift around us. Nothing was out of place. Everything was exactly as we had left it, but there was a strange, palpable unease. It felt as though the property was subtly altered, its reality twisted into something otherworldly, an alien. That's when I saw it. An orange, long-haired cat, perched quietly on a tree stump. Its eyes bore into me, fiery and unnerving. They held a strange intensity, almost as if they were glowing. As I locked eyes with the creature, time seemed to slow down. All other sounds faded into the background. There was only me and the cat, and its mesmerizing, terrifying gaze. Then, from the heart of the forest came a noise that shattered the silence, the crackling of branches, the crunching of pine needles underfoot. It came from all directions, disorientating, bewildering. But it was the voice that truly sent chills down my spine. It began as a timid, childlike call. 
Hello? Is anyone out here? Echoed through the woods. My wife responded, her voice shaking slightly. Then the voice changed. It transformed from a timid child's plea into a woman's terrified shriek for help, becoming more distorted and otherworldly with each call. The fear I felt was a force of its own, freezing me to the spot, but my wife seemed to respond differently. Against all logic, she was overcome with an inexplicable urge to find the source of the voice, to offer aid. She tried to dash off into the forest, but I managed to stop her. I knew there was something wrong, something off about the voice. It wasn't human, it wasn't right. Instead of venturing on foot, we got into our truck, armed with the strongest spotlights we could find. With our windows rolled down, we slowly crawled down the pathway, calling out into the darkened forest, sweeping our lights across the undergrowth. Suddenly, the voice came again, so close, so loud that it reverberated through the truck cabin, the agonizing plea seeming to come from right outside my window. It was as if the woods themselves were screaming. My reaction was instinctive. I slammed my foot on the gas, careening down the dirt road, away from the haunting plea, away from the oppressive presence of the forest. The property receded into the distance, but its terror remained etched in our hearts. We fled from that unearthly terror. Our sanctuary now turned into our tormentor and reported the incident to the police. But as I had suspected, they found no one. Just us, the land, and the inexplicable dread that bound us together. In the aftermath of that terror-filled night, we made the decision to leave the property. We were done being trapped in a nightmare we didn't understand, done with the strange occurrences, and done with the crushing sense of dread. This place had taken two lives, and we wouldn't let it take ours. We returned to the property the next day, but not to stay. We went there to collect our things, to retrieve remnants of our life which had once seemed so simple. Every step on that cursed land was heavy, like wading through an unseen swamp. The eerie quiet was only interrupted by the rustling of leaves in our hurried movements. As we packed our things, we took one last look at the property. The camper we once called home now seemed like a specter of past memories. The entire place felt stained, carrying the mark of unexplainable horrors. Yet amid this tainted landscape, life seemed to persist stubbornly. The trees stood tall, indifferent to the terror that had unfolded under their watch, and the orange cat perched atop the same stump, its eyes gleaming with an unnatural fire. The moment we left the property, it was like a dark shroud had been lifted. We could finally breathe without the feeling of a thousand unseen eyes watching us, finally move without the fear of what awaited us in the shadows. We left behind the inexplicable events, the cryptic threats, and the lingering dread. But we also left with a piece of it etched into our memory, a haunting reminder of the time spent there. My wife gave birth the very next day. The joy of welcoming our child was an oasis of light amid the lingering shadows of the past. We named our son Jay, after Jay, in memory of the man who had led us to the property, into the terror, and eventually back to life. Holding Jay in my arms, I made a silent vow to keep him safe, to protect him from the horrors we had faced. Life started to regain some semblance of normalcy, but the memories of our time on the property would spring up unexpectedly, like nightmarish echoes from the past. We would find ourselves pausing at random moments, taken back by a familiar sight or sound, but we were free, away from the physical manifestation of our fear, and for that, we were immensely grateful. The terror we lived through challenged my beliefs, forcing me to confront possibilities I had never considered before. Is it all a result of paranormal activity? A vengeful spirit, a cursed land, or something even more sinister? I didn't know then, and I still don't. But what I do know is that whatever happened at that place was beyond human comprehension, and perhaps it's better that way. We never returned to the property. After all, some doors, once opened, are best left closed. The land became a piece of our past, a chapter we chose to leave behind. The experience, however, would stay with us, a grim reminder of our brush with the unknown, with the terrifyingly inexplicable, with the darkness that lurked beneath the surface. Life had become something of a normal routine for us, but the memories of our time on that property lingered, casting a long shadow over our happiness. We had learned to appreciate the quiet moments, the mundane routines, and the joy that our son Jay brought into our lives. Yet, 
there was always an undercurrent of unease, a reminder of the terror we had once lived through. Two years had passed since we'd left the property, and we had done our best to put those chilling experiences behind us. However, something happened that brought it all rushing back with an icy shock of fear. I had just put Jay down for a nap when I heard it, a soft distant echo of a child's voice, eerily similar to the one we'd heard in the woods that night. My heart pounded in my chest as I looked around, the chilling familiarity of the sound setting my nerves on edge. There was no one around, just me and Jay in our quiet home. That night, as my wife and I lay in bed, we heard the rustling of leaves and the snapping of branches outside. The sounds were identical to those we'd heard that night on the property, so hauntingly familiar that it felt like we were back there, caught in that endless cycle of fear. We held each other close, a silent promise of safety against the remembered terror. Then came the voice. It was just a whisper, barely audible over the wind rustling through the trees, but it was unmistakable. Help me, somebody help. The plea pierced the silence of the night, setting my blood to ice. My wife clung to me, her eyes wide with fear, and in that moment we were back on the property, trapped in the truck, surrounded by the oppressive darkness of the forest. Every light in the house was suddenly switched on. We were too scared to sleep, too afraid to let our guard down. We spent the night in a terrified vigil, waiting for the dawn, praying for the safety of daylight. In the morning I found Jay in his room, playing with something. I froze as I recognized it, a small orange-haired cat toy. When I asked him where he got it, he pointed out the window and said, The nice lady gave it to me, Daddy. She was in the yard. My heart sank as he described her, her voice echoing in my mind, the very voice that had filled us with unadulterated terror. There was no woman, no cat, just us, and the echoes from the past. We never saw or heard anything after that day. The echoes seemed to fade away, swallowed by the reality of our daily lives. But the memory of them lingered, a terrifying reminder of the darkness we had left behind. Our time on the property had opened a door to a world I never thought existed, to a terror that defied understanding. And now, it seemed, that door had followed us, a chilling reminder that some shadows, once awakened, never truly disappear. We were safe, but the echoes from the dark continued to haunt us, a grim testament to the terror that once was and might still be. They say it's a great day when dreams come true, and that's exactly what it felt like when we moved into our new house. Not just any house, mind you. This was the house my parents had dreamed about for years. Hidden away from the world, nestled deep within the bosom of nature, it was the embodiment of their desire for tranquility. Me, the fresh out of high school kid, I was the last domino to fall before the moving plans were put into motion. Graduation over, all ties severed, it was time for the big leap. The house was beautiful, a relic of a bygone era, steeped in antiquity. It faced a sprawling expanse of 15 acres, most of which were cloaked in dense woods. Just behind the house, a half-acre pond lay like a sheet of shimmering silver under the sun. The best part was the solitude. Not a single soul lived within a mile of us. It was a stark change from my life so far, having grown up in a cozy small community, but the prospect of living in such an undisturbed pocket of nature was intriguing. Those first few days were a blur of unpacking and exploring. Every corner of the house and every tree in the woods seemed to have its own story, waiting to be unveiled. And so, I started walking in the woods regularly, usually in the late afternoons. There was something soothing about the rustling leaves under my feet and the melody of the birds returning home. The air smelled of wet earth and pine, a far cry from the homogenized sterile scent of city air. These walks became my sanctuary, a place where I could lose myself amidst the towering trees letting go of the stresses of studying and the pressures of transitioning into adulthood. In time, I became familiar with the woods. I learned the winding trails, found the small hidden glade where the deer often came to graze, and the old knotted tree that seemed like a wise elder, standing guard over its younger brethren. I would often sit by the pond, watching the water ripple in the soft wind, 
creating patterns that seemed almost like a coded message from nature. The woods welcomed me with open arms, a refuge from the outside world, a cocoon of peace and quiet. At first it was indeed a secluded paradise, but nature, as I would soon learn, has many faces. In her nurturing bosom hid secrets I was yet to discover. The quiet rustle of leaves would soon be broken by eerie silence and strange signs, but those were tales for another day. At the moment my secluded paradise was everything I'd hoped it to be and more. Little did I know, the dream would soon unravel, transforming into a living nightmare. My walks in the woods were like a daily ritual, a sort of meditation if you will. But as the days turned into weeks, the once comforting woods began to unfold unsettling signs that left me uneasy. I remember the first time I saw it, a partially eaten deer carcass sprawled on the forest floor, its insides picked clean. I remember the chill that ran down my spine and the putrid smell of rotting flesh that filled my nostrils. I remember thinking, it's the circle of life, trying to convince myself that it was probably just a coyote or a bobcat. It was the countryside after all, and I was intruding their home, not the other way round. But then, more carcasses began to appear, some half-eaten, others ripped apart as if by a savage beast, each discovery more gruesome than the last. It was more than any coyote or bobcat could have done. I found myself dreading my once cherished walks, a chill settling in my gut every time I thought of the mutilated deer. The smell of decay seemed to linger longer, now tainting the once fresh woody air with its nauseating stench. The tranquility of the woods started to shift as well, its soundtrack morphing from a symphony of forest life into an eerie silence, a silence so profound that it was almost deafening. The chirping of the birds, the rustling of leaves, the croaking of frogs, everything fell silent, swallowed by an inexplicable dread. The once lively woods now seemed to be holding its breath, as if anticipating something sinister. Then came the growls. They were low, almost a whisper against the quiet, yet distinctive. A guttural sound that seemed to vibrate against the trunks of the trees, echoing through the woods. Each growl sent a wave of shivers down my spine the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. A primal part of me recognized that sound, instinctively understood that it wasn't something I should take lightly. And so, I started carrying a gun on my walks. It was my parents' idea, they thought it would make me feel safer. But every crunch of leaves beneath my feet, every rustle of wind through the branches, made me grip it tighter. A constant reminder that I was no longer a mere observer, but a participant in a primal game of survival. My sanctuary had turned into a battlefield. Fear had tainted my once peaceful escape. It was no longer a place of solace, but a place of dread, an echoing silence, broken only by those haunting growls. The woods had changed, or maybe it was just me. Maybe I had intruded too far, seen too much. But one thing was clear. Whatever was out there, it was no longer just the woods and me. I was sharing my solitude with something else, something unknown and unsettling. My once soothing walks turned into a morbid fascination, a question that demanded an answer. I was scared, yes, but I was also curious. What was causing these changes? What was behind the eerie silence, the disturbing carcasses, and those menacing growls? Little did I know that my curiosity would lead me down a path of unimaginable terror, a path from where there was no turning back. I stopped my walks. The woods were no longer my escape. They were a threat. Yet the questions, the fear, the curiosity, they ate at me. I needed answers. I needed to know what lurked in the woods, the origin of those mutilated carcasses, the source of the was haunting growls. And so, I decided on a trail cam. It seemed like the perfect plan. I could stay safely indoors while the camera captured whatever was happening out there. The next evening I returned from work and mustered all my courage. I had the trail cam, fresh batteries and a mounting kit. My heart pounded like a drum against my chest as I trekked into the very woods I had sworn to stay away from. I wanted to turn back, every cell in my body screamed at me to flee, but the desperate need for answers pushed me forward. I walked deeper into the woods, feeling the ominous silence closing in around me. I found a tree about a hundred yards past the tree line and decided it was far enough. The adrenaline and fear made the whole process a blur. My hands trembled as I fumbled to set up the trail cam. In my haste, I dropped it. I bent down to pick up the camera, my heart racing, 
my mind filled with curses. That's when I smelt it, the familiar, sickening stench of decay. I froze. My blood ran cold. I looked around cautiously, but saw nothing. Yet, there was an unmistakable feeling of being watched. It was like a thousand tiny needles prickling at my skin, a sinister gaze that sent shivers down my spine. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I heard it, that low, guttural growl. It was close, too close. I froze, the sound reverberating in my chest. I looked towards the sound and there it was. It was not a coyote, not a bobcat. It was something else, something far more terrifying. The creature stood on its hind legs, a twisted, grotesque parody of a human. Its skin was charred, its body covered in patches of thin, straggly hair. But the face, it was the face that haunts my nightmares. Lipless, the raw red gums and razor-sharp teeth exposed. Saliva dripped from its chin, long, thick strings of mucus-like spit that gave off a putrid stench. The world seemed to stop. Time seemed to stretch into an infinite chasm. I was alone, alone in the woods with a creature straight out of my darkest nightmares. I had two options, stand my ground and face the creature or run. I chose to run. I dropped my camera and scrambled to my feet, sprinting back towards the house, my heart pounding in my ears. I felt like I was running for an eternity, the monster's growls echoing in my mind. But it was the sound of pounding hooves that spurred me on. It was running, running after me. Somehow I managed to reach my house. I slammed the door shut and collapsed, my body shaking, my mind in turmoil. I was safe, but my world had been shattered. I had seen the thing in the woods, and it was more horrifying than I could ever imagine. But there was no going back now. I had to find out what it was. I had to find a way to survive. I stayed frozen for a moment behind the closed door, my heart hammering wildly in my chest, listening to the ominous silence outside. There was no sign of the creature. The pounding hooves, the guttural growls, all were silenced. I was alone, at least for now. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily on me. I felt cold, my body shaking uncontrollably. My clothes clung to me, drenched in cold sweat. Every bone in my body ached, but my mind wouldn't let me rest. The image of that grotesque creature with its exposed red gums and needle-like teeth was burned into my mind. That night, I didn't sleep. I kept all the lights on and stayed vigilant, every small noise causing me to jump. But as the hours stretched on, and morning sunlight seeped in through the windows, I felt a strange sense of relief. The light brought a sense of safety, a stark contrast to the nightmares lurking in the darkness of the night. But I knew the peace was only temporary. The creature was still out there. I lived in a state of constant fear, never daring to venture into the woods. I kept my rifle close. It was my only sense of security against the horrors lurking out there. Sleep came in fits and starts. The peaceful woods, the idyllic retreat that I used to love, had turned into a nightmarish landscape. Yet I was determined to find answers. What was that thing? What did it want? How could I protect myself from it? In my quest for answers, I found myself on the internet, spending countless hours researching. I sifted through stories of mythical creatures, urban legends, and unexplained sightings. I read about werewolves, chupacabras, wendigos, but nothing seemed to match the thing I had encountered. That was until I stumbled upon the lore of the Skinwalkers. The Skinwalker, a shape-shifting witch of Navajo folklore, it was the closest match I could find. The description of its grotesque appearance, its ghastly screams, and the mutilated animals, they all seemed eerily familiar. But there were differences, too. My encounter did not completely align with the tales. Nevertheless, it was the only lead I had, the only explanation that gave some sense to the horror I was living through. I felt a strange sense of relief, knowing that there might be a name for the creature, that I was not alone in my terror. But with that came a deeper sense of fear. If it was a skinwalker, then how would I defend myself? How could I survive? With renewed determination, I decided that I would not be a helpless victim. I would fight back, protect my home. There was no guarantee that I could win against the creature, but I was resolved to do my best. The fear still gripped me, but it was no longer paralyzing. Instead, it fueled my desire to survive, to reclaim my life from the jaws of the monstrous creature. The thing in the woods had ignited a fire in me. I would not go down without a fight. 
My life was different now, tense, darker. Every day was filled with an underlying sense of dread that ate away at my sanity. Each moment, my mind was occupied by thoughts of that dreadful creature. But even as the fear threatened to consume me, I also felt a new resolve solidifying in my core. I was prepared to defend myself and my home from the monster. I'd loaded up on ammunition, checked and double-checked the locks on all the doors and windows every night. I'd even made a habit of setting up traps around the edge of the woods and around the house. Yet, despite all this, there was an undeniable fear. Each night, the glow from the moon would cast long, ominous shadows through the trees, my imagination turning each shadow into the creature, waiting to attack. The once peaceful songs of the night, the crickets, and the rustling of the leaves now sounded like a prelude to a dreadful horror. One particular night, as I lay in my bed, eyes staring at the ceiling, I heard it again. The guttural growl, the pounding of hooves on the dirt. My blood turned to ice. The creature was back. The growl turned into a terrible scream that echoed through the night, shaking me to my core. The noise got louder, and then, silence. It was as if the world was holding its breath, waiting for what was to come. And then I heard it. A scratch at the door, low and slow. Terror gripped me. I clutched the rifle tightly, my knuckles turning white. Slowly, I crept out of my bed, moving towards the door. With every step I took, the scratching became more frenzied, more desperate. As I neared the door, I mustered all my courage and peered through the peephole. There, just on the other side of the door, was the creature. Its eyes burned into mine, and for a moment I was frozen. Its grotesque features, the exposed gums, the charred skin, it was more terrifying up close. Its eyes held a haunting intensity, an animalistic hunger that sent chills down my spine. Then it drew back and charged at the door. The impact shook the house, the door groaning under the force. I stumbled back, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature rammed into the door again and again. I knew the door wouldn't hold up for long. Desperation filled me as I scrambled back to my room, barricading myself in. The ramming continued, each thud echoing like a death knell. But then, as suddenly as it started, it stopped. Silence. Eerily quiet. I sat there in the silence, rifle clutched in my sweaty hands, my heart pounding. The night felt like it would never end, the terror never relenting. I knew then that there was no escape. The creature would come back. The nights would be filled with fear and uncertainty. I'd encountered the thing in the woods, and my life was irrevocably changed. The terrifying reality was that it was out there, waiting, lurking. I was living in a never-ending nightmare. The skinwalker, the monster, had marked me, and there was no way out. I can still remember the crisp air, the sound of crunching leaves beneath our boots, the faint scent of earth and pine mixing with gun oil as we hiked through the wilderness. It was a tradition, a family hunting trip that brought us all together. Me, my dad, grandpa, uncles, and Neil, our close family friend. Neil was not family by blood, but by bond. He was a weathered, reliable man, as sturdy as the oak trees that lined the forest we trekked through. He had been a confidant of Grandpa's for as long as I could remember, a figure always present at family gatherings, his laugh as hearty as his tales were captivating. Honesty was one of Neil's core traits. He wasn't one to spin tall tales. So, when he decided to share a story that night, we listened with rapt attention. As twilight fell, we gathered around a roaring campfire, its glow casting dancing shadows against our faces. The conversation naturally veered from family updates to hunting strategies, then to more uncharted territories. Someone, maybe Uncle John, had brought up the topic of strange things seen in the wild, a fitting discussion considering the eerie ambiance the encroaching night bestowed upon us. As we traded stories, Neil was uncharacteristically quiet, staring intently into the fire. Then suddenly, he broke his silence. His voice, usually robust and cheerful, carried an unspoken gravity that instantly quieted the group. I've got a story, he said, from a hunt a few years back, out in western Idaho. Immediately our chatter ceased, replaced by the crackling fire and the distant hooting of an owl. I noticed my grandpa, usually nonchalant about most things, 
fix his gaze on Neil, his bushy eyebrows knitted in anticipation. My father and uncles leaned forward, their expressions mirroring the same curiosity. I remember feeling a shiver crawl up my spine, not entirely due to the chilly night breeze. Neil took a moment to collect his thoughts, staring into the fire as if it held the pieces of his tail. This was about the early 90s, he started, his voice a rough whisper against the rustling leaves. And so, under the vast expanse of the starlit sky, we listened, unknowingly embarking on a journey into the depths of a chilling past we had never expected to explore. As Neil began his story, he transported us back to the early 1990s, where he and his hunting companion set out for a remote part of western Idaho. Neil described the setting in such a way that we could almost see it, a desolate, beautiful landscape that held a peculiar charm despite its isolation. It was an hour or two away from Wiser, Neil's voice cut through the stillness of our campfire gathering. We'd gotten permission to hunt jackrabbits on a friend's property. It was a massive place, miles away from civilization, out in the heart of the desert. The moon was just beginning to rise over our campsite as Neil spoke, its silvery light casting an eerie glow over the forest clearing, a perfect ambiance for his story. His description of that particular night was so vivid, we felt as though we were there with him under the vast, clear Idaho sky. Neil continued, The property was unique, divided into two distinct parts. One half was a flat plain, wide and open as far as the eye could see. On the other was a towering hill that spanned the length of the private land, probably 200 to 300 feet high. Even in the simplicity of his words, Neil managed to convey a sense of grandeur and desolation that made us picture the barren plains, the moon casting long shadows across the arid expanse, and the hill looming like a silent sentinel over the land. We started our hunt a little after dusk, Neil said, his gaze far away as he recounted the past. It was a clear night, just like tonight. The moon was nearly full, illuminating the land with a ghostly light. Armed with the spotlight from my truck and our flashlights, we ventured out, scanning the plains for any signs of movement. His narrative was so engrossing that it was easy to forget the comfort of our fire-lit clearing. We were right there with him, on that flat plain, the powerful beams of their spotlights cutting swaths through the darkness, hunting for jackrabbits in the middle of a vast desert. As Neil's recollection of that haunting night unfolded, we were not just passive listeners anymore, we were active participants. We could almost feel the cool Idaho breeze on our faces, hear the distant echoes of the nocturnal desert life, and sense the eerie quietness that surrounded them in that secluded landscape. By the time midnight was approaching, Neil's voice dropped, a palpable sense of unease creeping into his words. We were deep into the property. That's when we first heard it. The scream. As Neil's voice trailed off, leaving his ominous words hanging in the crisp night air, I felt an unsettling chill. Little did we know, the eerie tranquility of our campsite was about to be shattered by a terrifying tale that none of us would ever forget. Neil's story took a sinister turn, his voice dropping to a hushed murmur as he described the disturbing events that unfolded that night in western Idaho. The cheerful camaraderie around the campfire now gave way to tense anticipation. We sat silently, our eyes wide and alert, held captive by the unfolding narrative. Midnight arrived. Neil's voice came barely above a whisper, his gaze fixed on the dancing flames of the campfire. And with it, a scream like nothing I'd ever heard before. It echoed from the hillside, a chilling, unearthly sound that seemed to reverberate through the whole desert. A silence followed his words. The crackling of the fire seemed unnaturally loud in the quiet, and I realized I had been holding my breath. Despite the warmth of the campfire, a shiver crept up my spine as I imagined the terror Neil and his companion must have felt. We froze, Neil continued, his gaze distant. I remember looking at my friend, our flashlights illuminating the fear etched on each other's faces. That scream. It wasn't human. It wasn't any animal we recognized either. Neil described the paralysis of fear, the haunting echo of the scream still bouncing around in their ears, and the growing sense of unease that enveloped them. His narrative was so visceral that I could almost hear the scream resonating in the quiet of our campsite. With a deep breath, Neil pushed on. After a few seconds that felt like eternity, 
I mustered the courage to lift my spotlight and scan the hillside with my scope. The silence that had descended was soon broken by another scream, this time even closer. His words seemed to linger in the air, carrying a note of dread. I could feel my heart beating faster, my imagination painting vivid pictures of their fear-stricken search for the source of the horrifying noise. I followed the sound, Neil said, his voice barely audible now. And then I saw it, the silhouette of a tall, lanky figure standing at the top of the hill, its upper body stark against the moonlit sky. A chill ran down my spine. It looked human, but it wasn't. The image Neil conjured was enough to send chills through us all. His recollection of the eerily human-like figure against the moonlit sky was haunting, and I remember feeling a knot in my stomach. I realized we were no longer simply listening to a scary story. We were experiencing Neil's terror as if it were our own. In a foolish attempt to scare it off, I fired a shot from my .22 rifle towards the silhouette, knowing it wouldn't reach. Neil's voice was grim. I wanted it to run, to get it out of sight, but that's not what happened. As Neil's words faded into the crackling silence of the campfire, I found myself holding my breath, waiting for the next part of his chilling tale. The thought of what happened next left an unsettling feeling that lingered like a cold shadow over the warmth of the campfire. Neil's voice, now a low murmur, seemed to blend with the whispering wind and crackling fire. The anticipation was palpable. Our hearts thumped in our chests as we waited for him to continue his chilling tale. Instead of moving away, Neil's voice broke the silence. The figure began to descend down the hill. It wasn't running. It wasn't hurrying. It was just steadily moving towards us. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as Neil described the figure's slow and deliberate movement. The shadowy creature was approaching them, and not even the gunshots could deter it. A sense of dread washed over us as we imagined the scene. Panic set in then, Neil explained, their earlier curiosity giving way to sheer terror. We ran, got in the truck, and drove as fast as we could towards the closest side of the property. I remember the deafening roar of the engine the white-knuckle grip on the steering wheel, and the cold fear that gnawed at our hearts. I could almost hear the roar of the truck's engine in Neil's voice, feel the bumping and jostling as they tore through the rough desert terrain. His words painted a vivid picture of fear and haste, the desperate need to escape from an unimaginable terror. We reached a gate, but it was locked, Neil recounted, his gaze distant. Without a second thought, I took my gun and shot the lock off. The loud bang echoed in the silent night, almost as if announcing our departure to the creature. Neil's narrative was so gripping, so vivid, that it was hard not to imagine being in the truck with him, hearing the shot echo through the silence, feeling the rush of cold night air as they raced away from the property. As they drove away from the desolate property, Neil cast one last look at the hill. In the rearview mirror, he whispered, I saw the silhouette still standing there against the moonlit sky watching us as we disappeared into the night. His final words hung heavy in the air, leaving us all in stunned silence. The story was over, but its terrifying echoes remained, lingering in the crackling fire and rustling leaves around us. We sat there, held captive by the haunting image of the creature standing on the hill, watching their escape. I don't know what that creature was, Neil finally said, breaking the silence. All I know is it wasn't human, and it terrified me like nothing ever has. That night still haunts me, years later. As his voice faded, we sat there in stunned silence. The haunting story, the chilling figure, and the terror-filled escape left us with a sense of fear and uncertainty. Neil's haunting tale of the creature in the desolate Idaho property was not just a scary story. It was a terrifying encounter with the unknown a chilling reminder of the mysteries and horrors that lurk in the dark corners of our world. It had been years since I'd last seen them. Mike, Brenda, Alex, Josh, Amber. We had all walked divergent paths after high school, but somehow our paths converged once more. We were drawn together again by our shared penchant for thrill, for adventure, the prospect of rekindling that old bond, that camaraderie, and satiating our thirst for adventure, had an undeniable allure. So when Mike called me up, proposing a trip down memory lane, I couldn't resist. We're going to a national park, 
Mike had told me, his voice echoing with enthusiasm even over the phone. The way he said it was enough to stir a knot of anticipation within me. It was not just any national park. This one was special, notorious for the sheer number of people who had disappeared within its bounds over the years. A small shiver ran down my spine at the mention of it. That sounds dangerous, I'd responded, apprehension creeping into my voice. This wasn't like our earlier adventures exploring abandoned buildings and playing around with Ouija boards and cemeteries. This was real, and people had actually gone missing. But Mike, the silver-tongued devil that he was, quickly reassured me. Don't worry, we'll be fine. Alex and I know our way around the wilderness. He insisted, downplaying my concerns. Two days later, my apprehensions were pushed to the back of my mind as I found myself driving towards the national park, eager to meet my friends. When we all finally met at the park's visitor center, the nostalgia hit me hard. It was just like old times. Mike with his mischievous grin, Brenda always radiating warmth and energy, Alex calm and collected, Josh the gentle giant, and Amber kind and caring as always. Seeing them all together after so long felt strangely comforting. But the reunion wasn't all warmth and nostalgia. As we unloaded our gear in the parking lot, I glanced at the bulletin board nearby. It was plastered with countless missing persons posters, a stark reminder of the park's grim reputation. I felt a chill run down my spine again. The prospect of adventure, which had seemed thrilling moments ago, suddenly felt terrifying. Just as we finished unloading, a weary-looking park ranger approached us. He looked at us, his tired eyes taking in our gear, our excitement, our anticipation. Hello, everyone. What brings you to our park? He asked, his voice carrying a certain tired resignation. Mike explained our plans, causing a shadow of worry to cross the ranger's face. His next words would linger in my mind for days to come. If you get lost out here, well, we don't have a good track record of finding nice folk like you. The ranger's words hung heavy in the air as he walked away. However, emboldened by our shared spirit of adventure and camaraderie, we decided to proceed. After all, we were here for the thrill, the adrenaline, the experience of the unknown. Little did we know what lay ahead in the hauntingly beautiful depths of the park. As our group moved deeper into the park, I felt a strange mix of trepidation and excitement. The park was breathtaking a sprawling expanse of verdant green stretching as far as the eye could see. Towering trees, dancing leaves, and a choir of bird songs filled the air, lulling us into a sense of tranquility. But underneath that tranquility, I could feel the unsettling undercurrent of the unknown. Our group, a diverse blend of personalities, chatted and laughed as we trekked further into the park. Alex and Mike, our self-proclaimed wilderness experts, led the way, the others followed, their excitement palpable. Even Brenda, who was usually the cautious one in the group, seemed to be embracing the adventure. We walked for miles, the wilderness around us getting denser with each step. But as we walked, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. I kept glancing back at our trail of footprints, fading slowly behind us. My mind kept circling back to the ranger's warning and the bulletin board brimming with missing persons posters. Our search for a suitable camping spot finally ended when we found a clearing deep within the woods. It was a picturesque spot, framed by towering trees and bathed in soft, dappled sunlight. We started to set up our camp, the air filled with the sounds of rustling tent fabric, clinking gear, and our jovial chatter. As we set up the camp, Mike and Alex surprised us by pulling out hunting rifles from their backpacks. I felt a shiver of unease at the sight of the weapons, but they assured us they were just a precaution. Just in case there's something more than squirrels out here, Mike said with a grin, his joke earning a round of chuckles from the group. By the time night fell, our camp was ready. We sat around a crackling campfire, sharing beers and swapping stories of our high school days. As the moon shone down on us and the stars twinkled in the sky, it almost felt like we were back in our teenage years, chasing adventures without a care in the world. However, as midnight approached, Mike made a suggestion that sent a chill down my spine. We should try and find some of those missing people out here. Some of them would just be bones by now. His words hung heavy in the air, and the jovial atmosphere around the campfire immediately turned somber. We all exchanged worried glances, our minds racing with the implications of his suggestion. The others quickly shot down the idea, but Mike, 
fueled by alcohol and a perverse sense of adventure, was not dissuaded. He, along with Alex and Brenda, decided to venture deeper into the woods. Their departure, shrouded in darkness and mystery, marked the end of our reunion's innocence. As I watched them disappear into the wilderness, I couldn't shake off a sense of dread. I remembered the ranger's warning and the eerie quietness of the forest. As the hours slipped by and they didn't return, I couldn't shake off the growing sense of dread. Something was terribly wrong, and we were in the heart of it. The early morning sun had started to peek through the dense foliage, casting long, eerie shadows. The campsite was quiet, devoid of the light-hearted banter from the previous night. An uneasy silence hung heavily, broken only by the crackling embers of the dying fire and our anxious whispers. Hours had passed since Mike, Alex, and Brenda had ventured into the wilderness, and they were yet to return. Our attempts to reach them on their phones were met with the relentless monotony of out-of-service beeps. The realization that we were isolated, without any means to contact the outside world, sent shivers down my spine. Despite the rising sun, an icy chill gripped my heart, threatening to freeze me in place. The decision to seek help was not an easy one. Leaving the safety of the campsite and venturing into the wilderness filled us with dread. But the thought of our friends, possibly injured and lost, outweighed our fear. We hurriedly gathered our flashlights, Alex's left-behind hunting rifle, and set off towards the visitor's center. The serenity of the morning felt deceptive, a calm before an impending storm. The path which was familiar to us now seemed ominous. Each rustling leaf, each creaking branch, each shadow felt threatening. The earlier excitement of exploration was now replaced with dread and fear. About 30 minutes into our journey, a chilling change occurred. The lively chirping of the birds, the rustling of leaves, the whispers of the wind, all came to an abrupt halt. The forest fell eerily silent, amplifying the sound of our nervous breaths and pounding hearts. The deafening quietude felt unnatural, as if nature itself was holding its breath in anticipation. Suddenly, the silence was shattered by a scream. Help! It was Mike's voice, filled with terror and desperation. The blood in my veins turned ice cold. The urgency and fear in his voice pushed us into a frantic scramble towards the source. We pushed through the undergrowth, our minds teeming with terrifying possibilities of what we might find. As we stumbled further off the path, we found a flickering flashlight, its beam flickering erratically across the forest floor. A few feet ahead, Mike's voice echoed again, pleading for help. But this time, something was off. His voice sounded unnatural, distorted as if mimicked by an impersonator. I called out, my voice trembling. Mike, are you hurt, buddy? The reply that came back sent chills down my spine. The voice was Mike's, but twisted, deformed in a way that felt inhuman. I could hear him say that they had found Alex and Brenda, but his words were slurred, his voice no longer filled with fear, but with an eerie calmness. Summoning the courage, I pointed my flashlight towards him, and my heart stopped. Mike was on his knees, his shirt bloodied, and his body hunched forward. The sight was horrifying, and my mind struggled to comprehend what I was seeing. A chilling realization hit me. Whatever was speaking to us was not Mike. It was something else, something far more terrifying. In that moment, my fear turned into raw terror. My heart pounded against my ribcage like a wild animal trapped in a cage. Panic rose like a tidal wave, threatening to pull me under. Something was terribly wrong, and we were caught in the middle of it. A hideous creature stepped into the dim circle of light, holding Mike's lifeless body like a grotesque puppet. It was unlike anything I had ever seen or imagined. Its skin was rough and gray, its eyes devoid of any human emotion. It held Mike's lifeless form up as though to taunt us with our friend's gruesome fate. Its voice was a low growl, chillingly devoid of humanity. They were so damn tasty. I could taste bile in my mouth as fear, pure and primal, gripped my heart. Before my terrified brain could even process the information, the creature dropped on all fours and charged at us. The hunting rifle, our only weapon, was knocked out of Josh's hand, and the creature was upon him, its monstrous strength overwhelming him instantly. Its attack was swift, a blur in the dim light. It knocked Amber and me off our feet as if we were mere dolls. I landed hard, the wind knocked out of me. A few feet away I could hear Amber's pain-filled scream as she hit the ground, her leg twisted at an unnatural angle. But there was no time to think. 
no time to help. The sound of Josh's desperate struggle against the creature filled the air. We were next. With adrenaline surging through my veins, I scrambled to my feet, pulling Amber up with me. We started to run, or rather, I started to drag Amber, as she couldn't support herself. The woods were dark and dense, the undergrowth thick and the path uneven. Each labored breath filled my lungs with cold, damp air, but there was no stopping. Behind us, Josh's screams abruptly stopped. The silence that followed was more terrifying than the struggle itself. My heart pounded in my ears, and I could feel the creature's eyes on us, its gaze cold and merciless. Suddenly, Amber was ripped from my grasp, her terrified scream echoing around the desolate woods. I turned just in time to see her being dragged away into the darkness by the monstrous creature. Her screams faded, replaced by a deafening silence, the kind that threatens to swallow you whole. I turned back and ran, propelled by the terror coursing through my veins. Each desperate step took me further into the unknown, but it didn't matter. All I knew was that I had to get away, get as far away from that thing as I could. I was alone, in a forest teeming with danger, running from a creature that had already claimed three of my friends. Suddenly the ground beneath me gave way, and I was falling. The world around me spun, and then everything went black. I had fallen off a cliff. I landed with a sickening thud, my body screaming in pain. The stench that hit me was like a physical blow. It was the smell of death. I was surrounded by darkness, but as my eyes adjusted, I realized the horror of my situation. I was in a mass grave, surrounded by hundreds of corpses. Some of them I recognized. Alex, Amber, even the park ranger we'd met earlier that day. The sight was beyond horrifying. It was nightmarish. Frozen in terror, I could only watch as the creature tossed two more bodies into the pit. Its guttural growls echoed around me as it searched through the pile, looking for me. Desperate, I lay still, my breath hitched in my throat, playing dead. All around me, the dead stared back with empty eyes, their silent screams echoing in the pit. And in that moment, amidst the decaying bodies of my friends and hundreds of others, I realized the horrifying truth. We had walked right into a death trap. Dawn broke, the soft rays of light peeking through the dense forest canopy casting long, ominous shadows around me. I was still in the pit, covered in dirt and grime, playing dead among the real dead. But as the morning light touched my face, I could feel hope stirring within me. Throughout the night, the creature had returned multiple times. Each time it tossed another body into the pit, I had to suppress my gasp of horror, stifle my sobs, remain still. The cold, empty eyes of my friends staring back at me was an image that would be etched in my memory forever. Hours seemed to turn into days, and with each passing moment the certainty of my own death grew. Yet the creature never found me. I stayed as quiet and as still as I could, my heart pounding in my chest with each of its visits. But by the time the morning light filtered through the trees above, the creature was gone. With the creature gone, I cautiously climbed out of the pit, my body aching and my heart heavy. The morning was eerily quiet the forest around me still and silent, as though in mourning for the lives lost. The search for the others had to begin. I was their only hope now. I started back towards the camp. The journey back was just as terrifying as the one I had taken last night. Every rustle of the leaves, every snap of a twig made my heart jump. But there was no sign of the creature. The campsite was deserted. The campfire was now just a pile of ashes, our tents shredded and abandoned. The eerie silence was occasionally broken by the faint rustling of leaves or the hooting of an owl in the distance. It was a haunting reminder of what had happened here. Suddenly, a weak cry broke through the silence. Following the sound, I found Ben. He was lying half-conscious against a tree, his body bruised and bloody. Sam, he croaked as I knelt down next to him, his hand weakly clutching my arm. It took them, all of them. I nodded, trying to hide my tears. I know, Ben, I know, but you, you survived, how? I didn't answer him, I didn't have an answer. I had just survived by some twist of fate. I didn't feel like a survivor, I felt like a coward. But in that moment I realized I had a chance to make things right, to warn others, to stop this from happening again. As I helped Ben, I knew our journey was far from over. We had to get back to civilization, we had to warn the authorities about the creature. We were survivors, 
and now it was our responsibility to ensure that no one else fell prey to this monster. Our journey back was grueling, but with each step, each struggle, we moved forward. With every mile we put between us and the campsite, the terror of the past night became a little more distant. With the memories, the faces of our friends, they remained with us. Our survival was a harsh reminder of their deaths, but it was also a beacon of hope, the hope that we could make a difference, that we could save others from meeting the same fate. It was a small comfort, but in the vast expanse of the terrifying forest, it was all we had. After what felt like an eternity, Ben and I finally stumbled back into civilization. We looked like ghosts, emerging from the depths of the wilderness, haunted by the events that had transpired. Our warnings were met with disbelief. We were brushed aside, our accounts dismissed as ramblings of traumatized minds. Yet we knew the truth. The danger was real, and it was lurking in the forest, waiting for its next victims. Ben and I were admitted to the local hospital. The physical wounds were healed swiftly, but the mental trauma lingered. Lying on the white hospital bed, staring at the sterile ceiling, I could still smell the damp earth of the pit, still feel the dread that had clung to my skin. Ignoring the doctor's advice, I checked myself out of the hospital a day later. I was restless, the hospital walls closing in on me. Ben decided to stay. He needed the rest more than I did. I visited the local sheriff's office, demanding to be heard. I recounted our horrific tale again, hoping that this time, someone would listen. The sheriff, a gruff middle-aged man, listened patiently. His stern expression remained unchanging as I narrated our ordeal. Once I finished, he stood up and walked over to the window, staring out at the peaceful town. I'll send a patrol up there, he said finally, his voice deep and grave. We can't ignore such claims, even if they seem outlandish. Despite his skepticism, it felt like a small victory. The following days were a blur of endless discussions, meetings with local authorities, reporters, and anyone else who would listen. I was adamant, determined to get our message across, to ensure that no one else suffered our fate. However, as the days turned into weeks, it became clear that our warnings were falling on deaf ears. The patrol sent by the sheriff returned with nothing. The local news outlets began treating our story as a sensationalized tale, a local curiosity. The creature of the forest became a ghost story, an urban legend. It was disheartening, frustrating, but I refused to give up. I spent countless nights huddled over my laptop, posting on forums, reaching out to environmental groups, national parks, any organization that could help. I received a flood of responses, ranging from sympathetic to scornful, but nothing concrete. I didn't sleep much. Nightmares filled my dreams, images of the creature, the pit, my friends. I woke up in a cold sweat each time, the terror still fresh, as if I was back in the forest. Each nightmare steeled my resolve. I had to keep fighting, keep pushing, for the memory of my friends, for the safety of others. As I sat there one night, the screen illuminating my tired face, I wondered if anyone would ever believe us. Would our story just become another forgotten legend, our warnings ignored until it was too late? But as I scrolled through the supportive messages, the people offering help, I knew I couldn't give up. For every skeptic, there was a believer. For every dismissal, there was support. Despite the odds, despite the disbelief, I would continue to fight. Because I knew the truth, I knew the danger that lurked in the forest. And as long as I was alive, I would continue to warn others, to protect them from the terror we had faced. The creature had taken a lot from me, but it wouldn't take my resolve. I was a survivor, and I would not be silenced. Months had passed since our ordeal, and the world seemed to have moved on, but I hadn't. I couldn't. I was chained to the memory, shackled to the burden of knowledge, the haunting truth. And that truth was a beast, an unspeakable terror that slumbered in the woods. My life had become a symphony of warnings, a relentless cacophony of alerts and pleas falling on indifferent ears. The disbelievers were louder, their skepticism stifling my efforts. The creature was nothing more than a legend now, a sensationalized bedtime story. But the danger was as real as the scars that adorned my body. One evening, as the sun set on another day of my crusade, a chilling wind swept through the town. An unnatural hush fell, a stillness that was jarring in its suddenness. 
I felt my skin prickle, my heart quicken. There was a familiarity to the silence, a dreadful reminder of the eerie quiet in the forest right before. The deafening wail cut through the silence, echoing in the still night air. It was a sound I'd hoped to never hear again, a sound that still haunted my nightmares. My blood ran cold, my breath hitched. It was the creature, beast. It had come. As the panicked screams filled the air, I raced towards the center of town, where the wailing seemed to originate. The once peaceful town was now a scene of chaos. People were running helter-skelter, their faces etched with terror. Amidst the pandemonium, my gaze fell on the sheriff's office. The gruff middle-aged sheriff who had dismissed my warnings stood frozen, staring at the monstrosity that was wreaking havoc. His face was a mask of disbelief and horror. The skeptic had become a believer, but at what cost? The creature was just as I remembered, its menacing presence filling the space, its eyes reflecting the chaos it was causing. The sight of it struck me like a bolt, the memories rushing back in a torturous flood. But it was not fear that gripped me, it was fury. We had warned them, tried to prepare them, but they chose to ignore, to brush it off as a delusion. Now, they were paying the price. We were paying the price. I watched as the creature disappeared back into the forest, leaving behind a town in ruin. The silence that followed was the loudest I had ever heard, a grim reminder of our failure, of their failure. As the reality of the night's events began to sink in, a terrifying thought crossed my mind. This was just the beginning. The creature had tasted blood, seen the ease with which it could cause destruction, and now it would be back for more. I was not a seer, but I didn't need to be one to predict the horror that lay ahead. The beast would return, and when it did, it would bring with it a terror beyond our wildest fears. The nightmarish ordeal we had suffered in the forest was but a preview of the horror show that was to come. My final thought, as the terrifying silence of the night enveloped me, was that perhaps next time, they would listen. Perhaps next time, it wouldn't be too late.